Claire and I searched high and low for an apartment in our price range. Unfortunately, the dismal pays of our entry-level positions and a finicky housing market in such a large city meant we weren't able to find much. We toured an endless parade of sad, lonely rooms with ugly 70s carpeting and enough peeling wallpaper to plaster an entire house. Claire's parents allowed us to stay in the guest room of their brownstone, but it was clear that our presence was wearing thin. Just when I thought we'd have to settle for something the size of a pillbox, Claire came running into our room with her laptop. Amanda, look, look at this place. She thrust it into my hands, pointing excitedly at the listing on the screen. It advertised a moderately sized but comfortable five-room apartment in the Bracken Park neighborhood. It was only 1500 a month and a 10-minute train ride from work for either of us. It had an attractive gallery-style kitchen, relatively new carpeting, and closets in both bedrooms. I smiled at her. Okay, what's the catch? Does the exterminator need to be called every other week? Are the neighbors upstairs tap dancers? She shook her head. I'm serious. I've looked over all the pictures and read the description. It sounds too good to be true. That it does, I said scrolling through the listing. It wasn't the Ritz, but it was better than any other place we'd seen before. Oh, here it is, Claire said, pointing to a microscopic line of text near the bottom. It says it's on the ground floor of the building. Windows face an alley. I shrugged. So what if we don't get a view? I want to see it. A few days later, we took the train from Claire's parents' place. Twenty minutes later, we found ourselves in front of a ramshackle brick building, four stories tall, with small windows crammed into every available wall space. We followed the realtor down a flight of stairs behind a gate in the front entrance. Down a carpeted hall, we stopped at a small door with 105 engraved on it. The pictures really did the place justice. The living and dining rooms were one space with an open archway to the kitchen. A short hall led to two bedrooms and a bathroom. The previous owners had obviously loved the place well. It was inviting and cozy with soft rose-colored carpet and walls paneled in light wood. Claire stared out the window in the bedroom at the end of the hall. I do wish this faced the street or something. A little more interesting than just a brick wall. It was true. All that could be seen was the side of the building next to us. The concrete floor of the alley was cracked and chipped. A breeze gusted in the thin space between the apartments, creating an eerie, hollow sound. Claire shivered. Ugh, that's gonna keep me up at night. In the end, we decided to sign the papers that day. It was more than we could ask for for our first place together. Claire's parents acted sad, but were secretly happy to hear that we were moving out. A week later, after all the formalities were cleared, we moved our things inside. The first night was pure bliss. We cooked spaghetti in our new kitchen and watched a few episodes of Friends on a laptop on the living room floor, trying not to drip sauce on the carpet. After eating, we were tempted to give up unpacking and get out some sleeping bags, but in the end, we managed to overcome our lethargy and set up our bed in the room at the end of the hall. As Claire laid the sheets, I leaned over and gave her a kiss. I'm glad we finally found a place. She smiled. Me too. Things went well for our first week. It took us just a few more days to get everything out of the boxes. We celebrated by having some friends over for dinner. We thought the apartment would be too small to fit everyone comfortably, but the party turned out fine. Everyone oohed and awed over the stuff we had set up. Even though we'd only been there for a week, I could tell we'd stay there for quite some time. I can't remember if I first saw the man in the alley the night of the party or the night after. Sometimes I wonder how differently things could have gone if I'd gone out and bought curtains sooner. 
It wouldn't have stopped what happened, but it would have downplayed Claire and I's involvement. Our old ones were lost in the move, and we'd been putting off going to the store. I'm not sure exactly what time I woke up the first night. I just remember opening my eyes and seeing him standing outside the window. There were streetlights on the sidewalk on either side of the alley, so there was just enough illumination to make out small details. He wore a tattered brown coat with the collar pulled all the way up. He stood stiff as a board, with his back to the window like he was staring at the wall of the opposite building. The eerie whistling sound through the alley started up. As if on cue, the man went limp, his legs bending slightly. He slowly lifted his right arm above his head, letting the fingers dangle there. There was a moment's pause. Then, he began twirling on his feet. His movements were odd and jerky, like there was something on his shoe he was trying to shake off. His arms moved mechanically, lifting them up and lowering them in time, as if to some unheard piece of music. He flounced in and out of the shadows, managing to keep his face pointed towards the opposite wall the whole time. This went on for nearly five minutes. Just when I considered shaking Claire awake, he suddenly stopped his movements and went limp again. He lifted his leg up very high and brought it down like he was a cartoon character tiptoeing. Though his whole body was pointed to the right as he jerked away out of my line of sight down the alley, his head never moved from facing the opposite wall. I laid there, in the dark, for several minutes afterwards, trying to process what I had just seen. Goosebumps crept up my arms. Who was that man? Why was he in the alley so late at night? I told Claire what I saw in the morning as we got ready to leave for work. She looked a little troubled, but mostly shrugged it off. Amanda, this isn't exactly the nicest section of the city. I bet it was just some junkie jumping at shadows or something. I wouldn't worry too much about it. That last sentence was easier said than done. I spent most of my shift daydreaming, thinking about the unnatural angle that the man's neck was bent. That evening, while I entered the building, I looked down the alley that ran parallel to our window. It was empty, save for a few pieces of litter. I frowned and hoped that he wouldn't come around again that night. Throughout dinner, Claire and I talked about what happened. We both concluded that it was probably a one-off encounter. That put my mind at ease. Just before we went to bed, I made a mental note to go to the store the next day and buy curtains. Even though I felt better about the whole thing, I still slept that night facing away from the window. The whistling sound still came from the alley, but in a way it felt comforting because that meant it was empty. I fell asleep quicker than I expected. When I opened my eyes hours later, I knew he was outside. The clock on the nightstand flashed 2.15. I felt his eyes burning into me, even though my back was to him. I laid there for several seconds, scared out of my wits, trying to decide what to do. I couldn't just go back to sleep. I rolled over and looked out the window. He stood about six feet away from the window, facing our building this time. He wore the same ratty brown coat. I couldn't make out any further details because it was so dark. Despite the shadows that prevented me from seeing his face above the upturned collar, I was sure he was looking directly into the room. He resumed the same flat position, arms against his sides, legs stiff together. Without warning, he took another one of his long, cartoony steps forward. He brought his arms out and above his head, the hands and fingers angled downward like he was doing a Dracula impression. He held that position for a few moments while I continued to stare, 
petrified. Another stab brought him within three feet of us. One of the upstairs neighbors must have had their lights on, because a single beam managed to puncture the wall of darkness that covered his face. His skin was grayish and sallow, the hair on his head blowing slightly in the breeze, his mouth downturned in a frown, lips almost reaching to his chin. One eye was open, the other closed. I saw dark spots covering the lid, whitish and swollen. He took another step and was almost to the window, his fingertips against the glass. I leaned over to shake Claire. As I did so, the man brought his arms down, nails scratching loudly on the pane. Claire opened her eyes and turned over. Amanda, what? She started to say. She looked towards the window. A gasp caught in her throat. What the hell? She cried. I reached over to grab my phone. The screeching of the nails against the glass intensified as the man increased his speed, swinging his arms up and down like he was directing a plane. Just as I dialed 911, the man froze. He stopped his jerking movements and turned his face up to stare. Several tense seconds passed. Without another sound, he turned robotically to the right and took more exaggerated steps further down the alley, disappearing into the night. It was hard explaining to the cops that arrived 20 minutes later what happened. As the officer took down our statements, two others walked around the alley with flashlights, looking for someone we knew wouldn't be there. The officer offered a car to be sent and drive by the alley a few times the next night if we wanted. But after that, there wasn't much they could do. We could call if anything else strange happened. He apologized that he couldn't help beyond the formalities, and left. It wasn't much comfort. Claire and I made sure to get off early the next day so we could buy curtains. We picked out a heavy set with a view of the New York City skyline on it. Tacky, but they would get the job done. We hung them up as soon as we got home. As the hours ticked by and night rapidly approached, I sensed the apprehension in the air. We ate dinner in silence and went to bed after a few hours of TV. As I turned off the light, I stared at the vista of buildings printed on the curtains. Not a single ray of light passed through them. The room was pitch black. Claire smiled as I got into bed. This should scare the guy away. When I woke up the next morning, I didn't feel at ease right away. I hadn't woken up during the night, which was a good sign. But what if the man had been there anyway, standing right outside the window? Quietly, without waking Claire, I slipped out of bed and opened the curtains. The white scratches of the man's fingernails on the glass stood starkly in the early morning light. I tried to remember how many there were the previous day and if there were more now, but I couldn't recall. I thought the curtains would have relaxed me, but while we dressed and left for work, it was clear that neither of us were feeling better. As Claire and I kissed each other goodbye, we hugged for a few moments longer. On the train ride home that evening, I wondered if the cops had driven by the previous night like they said they would. Maybe the man never came at all. Maybe he was there the whole time doing his strange waltz. I thought about looking at new listings when I got home. Claire had obviously been as rattled as I was because she suggested we stay at her parents' place that evening. But it was a weeknight, and their townhouse was a half-hour train ride to our works. In the end, we decided to stay. The bedtime ritual went as usual. Close the curtains, turn off the lights, lay with my back to the window. Before I fell asleep, I managed to convince myself that nothing would happen. I should have known better. What woke me up at two o'clock wasn't the feeling of the man's eyes on me. 
but I'm sure I could have sensed them through the fabric. No, it was the frantic scratching of his fingernails on the window. I sat upright in bed and turned to stare. There was an inch-wide gap in the center of the curtains. I saw his arms waving frantically as they attacked the glass. Claire! I shook her awake and she sat up as well. Her eyes widened in anger. Not this time! She got up and threw the curtains open. The man was framed in the window, his fingernails still screeching. His shadowy face pointed directly at Claire's. She took a step back and cried out. The man stopped his assault and resumed the still Dracula-like position. His head shifted towards us and caught in the neighbor's light again. His skin had taken on a greenish hue, and I could see dark spots of rot dotting his face. We both screamed. Without warning, he started floating backwards. His feet left the ground as he rose away from the window, swinging in the air like a pendulum. The whistling sound reached a crescendo. He reached the apex of his flight six feet up the other wall. Claire and I did nothing but stare. A few seconds passed. Then, without warning, he came swinging towards the window. We backed up, falling against the bed. The man hit the glass with enough force to crack it. Dark blood exploded on the panes, spurting out of his broken nose. He floated back again, taking another swing and crashed hard. A crack in the skin blossomed on his forehead, dribbling more blood and revealing a slice of his skull. The man swung back and hit it a few more times, each time creating more cracks and covering the window with red. We barely saw him through the mess of blood and hair. One more strike and I was sure the glass would shatter. He backed up again. Claire and I prepared to run out of the room. His flight towards us was slower this time, coming to a rest right outside. We stared at his ruined face as he glared lifelessly back. The man suddenly jerked upward, half his body disappearing above the top of the frame. He flailed like a rag doll. I heard a few sickening cracks and knew what was coming. With one final crack, his head, arms, and legs from the knee down came away from his body, the rest falling past the window and hitting the alley floor with a loud thud. His limbs and head hung in the air for a moment, without a torso, before disappearing upward. It was hard explaining to the 911 operator what had happened. I could barely speak. She didn't believe us at first, but agreed to send a car out. A few minutes after the cops arrived, we heard one of the officers outside throw up. We were later told that the man had been dead for at least a week. His head, arms, and lower legs were found on the roof, thick wires sewn and weaved into them. The rest of him lay in a bloody heap in the alley below. The detective tried to tell us that he must have hung himself in his apartment in that bizarre fashion and the body accidentally fell out the window. I could tell he was grasping at straws for an explanation. We left the apartment a week later and moved to a new neighborhood. Most nights, I lie awake, thinking. I wonder who the man was. I wonder how he ended up like that. And most of all, I wonder what was up there on the roof, controlling his body like a marionette, making him dance outside her window. A huge, huge thank you to all of my poltergeists. Alex Schaefer, Bobby Tripp, Calderin, Daniel O'Connell, Erica Warren, Forever, 
Shadow Blackhawk, JTX-31, Mark Zipan, Brian Horn, Spirit Father, Stephen Swiftbird, Twisted Skipster, Alternative Knight, and Michael Fox. Your donations and continued support are so, so appreciated. So, as always, thank you. From the very bottom of my heart. Me, Sam, Harry, and Jack were as close as young friends could possibly get. Our year group was made up of about 13, 14 people, so becoming friends with everyone was a guarantee, yet we shared a much deeper bond. We did absolutely everything together, and unlike a lot of friend groups where you may prefer some members over others, we all shared the same amount of admiration and respect for one another. And it was an unmatched period of time in my life in terms of acceptance and true, unrivaled happiness. Until Harry was taken. <laughs> 